All right. So, Jesus had been... <laughs> it's here for Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Jesus. Jesus was hanging out with his disciples. They had been in public. And as they were hanging out, they were gathering around and kind of doing the chit-chat. And then there's this one guy in the crowd. He steps forward. Everybody takes a notice. He's uh, clearly a rising star. He had the appearance of someone who is accomplished beyond his years. And back in Jesus' day, things like wealth and financial prosperity, people took that as a sign of spiritual favor. So a guy like this steps out. He instantly looks like someone who could maybe run for office. And, and they're like, wow, God must like this guy a lot. And then he asks Jesus a question in front of everybody. He says, Teacher, what do I have to do to like really lock in my spot in heaven? I've obeyed all the rules ever since I was a kid. What's next for a guy like me? And he says it with a wink and a smile. And Jesus says, wow. <laughs> uh, pff, I don't know. You know what you could do? You could, why don't you sell all your stuff just to sort of get it out of the way and just follow me. And the man's face falls. He's visibly downcast, and he walks away from Jesus in that crowd. Hard pass. Well, his disciples are there, and Peter, who is typically the most outspoken, asks the question that probably all of his committed disciples were probably thinking. He said, well, Jesus, what about us? I mean, we've left everything to follow you. And Jesus says, oh, Peter, you don't have to worry about that. Anybody who gives anything up, for the kingdom of heaven will receive 100-fold in return. Privately, Peter's probably thinking, very cool. He starts sort of calculating the, the value of that little fishing business he, he left behind, that little boat he had, and all that gear. And then Jesus adds, he says, oh, and Peter, before you get too carried away here, let me teach you something about how that kingdom works, which is really something that we've been enjoying all summer, right? The series Around the Fire has been all about drawing close to Jesus when he tells stories and learning how our lives here on earth can get into rhythm with the kingdom of heaven. It's a forever kingdom. And if you want to follow along with this story, I'd encourage you to do so. If you brought a Bible, you want to power one on, you can find this story in Matthew chapter 20. And I'll start telling it to you from the very beginning. Jesus starts telling a story. He says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And after agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them out to work in the vineyard. Now, uh, denarius is a, a, Roman, uh, a Roman measure for a day's wage. That was the amount that you could earn even if you were an unskilled laborer, even if you were a common soldier. You could count on a denarius. You could expect uh, on receiving that if you just went ahead and put in a day's work. So Jesus goes on. He says about the third hour. He saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, hey, why don't you guys go into my vineyard too? And whatever is right, I will give you as well. See, this landowner, the master of the house, he, he stumbles across more able-bodied people. He puts them to work as well. Now, now notice that they didn't agree on a specific amount of money up front. This was not a haggling moment. You and I might do that in this day. But also in this day, if you're familiar with trades work, trades guys use this phrase all the time. They say, hey, I'll take care of you. It's, it's, the, it's the landowner's commitment that he will make it worth their while. They'll settle up on the other side of the day's work. And that's good enough for men, for them. So they go and join the work too. Jesus says that they went and then going out about the sixth hour and then again on the ninth hour, he did the same thing. And catch this. About the 11th hour, he went out and he found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, well, because no one's hired us. And so he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. So let me translate. Even to the point of only having one hour remaining on the workday, the master is willing to bring guys into his workforce 
to get work done in his vineyard. Why? Well, he's really excited about his harvest, and there is plenty of work for everyone. The story Jesus is telling goes on. He says, when evening came, the owner owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call all the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received, catch this, a denarius. Guys who had only worked one hour. Now, when those hired came first, the earliest working guys, when they saw this, they thought they would receive more. Now, that makes sense to you and me, right? These earliest workers watching the latest workers getting paid a denarius, they're thinking, wow, this is a good day. Hey, Siri, what's a denarius times 12? Because I was here for 12 hours putting work in. Looks like I'm finally going to get some rims for my chariot. And so Jesus says those who hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. Anybody feeling some of that right now? But the landowner replied to one of them, friend, I I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? And then Jesus finishes it by saying this. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. I think we've got some amazing things that we can learn from a story like this. I want to give you three notes that we can make, and they really all center around what the kingdom of God is all about and how it differs from the kind of kingdoms that we tend to run. Three notes on the story. Here's the first one. In God's kingdom... Everyone comes out ahead. If you're writing things down, here you go. In God's kingdom, everyone comes out ahead. I mean, this was the point of Jesus' story, right? Is that Jesus would show us how life works, how heaven works, and how they can work together. And Jesus says, in God's kingdom, everyone comes out ahead. There is a really clear trait of this landowner that is the same trait of the king of heaven That trickles into his kingdom. And what's the trait? I'll sum it up with a word. It's grace. What is grace? Well, grace is kindness and favor that you don't deserve. My wife and I hate late fees. We hate them with a passion. We're pretty much always on time with every payment. But once in a while, somehow some mail gets missed or we out of town or some mistake is made. And then I look at the bill and I see a late fee. I call them up and I tell you what my posture is. I'm never angry because I know that somehow we did that. And when I ask, I use the word, could we ask for some mercy? Could we ask for some grace? Why? Because I know that I don't deserve for them to remove that fee. Now, I could, I could get all threatening and say, I'll just start using other credit cards or anything like that. But at the end of the day, I'm at their mercy. That's what grace always is. It's something that you can't earn and you can't expect. Here's what you can do. You can just receive it if it is offered to you. Do you see grace in this story? You and I as a 2021 audience... We see it right away in the absurd pay scale in the story, right? New workers creep into the labor force later and later in the day, but they all leave getting paid the same wage as everybody else. Can I ask you a question? Is the boss actually allowed to do that? Well, sure he is. It's the boss's prerogative. Now, keep in mind that this is in a day before there was a such thing as trade unions, (laughs) This is in a day and age before there were such thing as prevailing minimums that would dictate how a company would pay its workers and require some kind of minimum amount of of everybody. It's the boss's prerogative on how he pays his workers. And so naturally, it leaves Jesus' audience leaving Jesus, scratching their heads, asking themselves this question. 
what kind of boss would just go ahead and be willing to give everyone the same no matter what they gave him? And the answer is only an extremely generous boss, one that was into a thing called grace. That's the grace that Jesus, that our, our audience picks up on. But let me tell you the grace that Jesus' audience would have picked up on. It's the grace of anybody being able to work at all. That would have stood out to him. See, in God's kingdom, everybody comes out ahead. In Jesus' day, it was also in a day before a such thing called unemployment. There were no social work, so social welfare uh, programs in Jesus' day. There were no, no COVID checks to just kind of keep you at home. and, and it, none, none of that. And so in Jesus' day, if, if you were given the opportunity to work, well, gosh, you considered yourself hashtag blessed. And so they see that and they realize, wow, everybody who gets to put in a day's work comes out ahead. That's what Jesus is teaching about God's kingdom, is that if you are in it, it's only because of grace. That goodness is only because God is kind. Let me give you probably what I would consider the most famous verse in the entire Bible about grace. It's in Ephesians chapter 2, and it goes like this. It's by grace that you're saved. And it's, it's through your faith in Jesus that God sent Jesus to forgive us of our sin and free us from our sin. It's by grace you've been saved through faith, and it, this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, and it's never going to be a result of works, of what you can do so that no one can boast. It's a grace, a level of kindness that I never could have earned and I never could have expected changes my life. It's by grace that you're rescued. And that, that verse goes on to say how grace changes us. It says that from that point forward, we've sort of become God's special spiritual rehab project. And he creates us in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Listen, how powerful is God's grace that the moment we decide to embrace it and start carrying it, that's the moment that God's grace embraces us and starts carrying us. Grace that redefines who I am and changes everything that I do. It's from the moment forward that you trust Jesus for God's grace, that you enter into this spiritual ki kingdom, and as a very real citizen of that kingdom, you get to start living in that kingdom and for that kingdom where Jesus Christ is Lord. You get to start doing that immediately, like pre-heaven, like early, it's a kingdom that can reign in your heart and revolutionize your life until one day that kingdom will be the only kingdom that remains. And it will reign on in a place where there's no more tears, no more pain, no more death, no more debates about vaccines or politics. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome. That's the deal that every one of us is offered and yet none of us are owed. You see, in God's kingdom, everyone comes out ahead. Here's a second note you can make about this story. It's that grace is never about fairness. Grace is never about fairness. Did anybody here grow up with a parent that when you said, Mom, Dad, that's not fair, they said, well, we're not, right, we're not at the fair. <laughs> Which I didn't grow up saying. And so my kids come in and I screw it up. And I say, well, we're not at the carnival. And we both look at each other. And nobody knows what we're talking about anymore. But that's, I've heard other people say, oh, I got so sick and tired of my parents saying that. Well, we're not at the fair. Fairness is something that's like really dear to our hearts. Grace is never about fairness. I'll tell you a story from my college days. I took a semester off of being a, a full-time college student uh, in order to pick up a, just a, like a few classes on the side. What I really needed to do was, was bank up funds so that I could go back to being a full-time student. So uh, I, roll, I enrolled in like one, maybe two community college classes, and then I, I got some work as a laborer uh, in, a, in a local kind of an indoor construction outfit. They were, they were, um, they were making insulated piping, okay? Uh, it was this fairly accessible job. And so I worked there uh, just for like a few months with a guy named Chuck. Now, Chuck is, um, I want you to picture kind of a snarky guy, wiry, 
Um, one of those people that you, you, you always wanted to know what mood he's in because sometimes he could be like making jokes and expecting everyone to laugh at his jokes. And there's other moments you just feel like he's just ready for a fight. In fact, I feel like under the, underneath he's always ready for a fight, but it depends on what mood you catch him in. Uh, that was like to work uh, with Chuck. And I got to tell you, Chuck didn't like me very much. And I realized pretty quickly that's not my fault. Uh, I think it probably had something to do with I was half his age, but both of us were just doing the same work as equals. And I feel like I was probably this sort of daily reminder that there are some people who really need this job. And then there are other people who just, you know, are just going to be here until they're done with it. So that was what it was like to have, you know, sort of a non-relationship with Chuck. But the story I'm thinking of is this one day where I came back to the work floor about 45 minutes after the bell, after everybody else came back from break and were working. Then there's 45 minutes past, and then I show up, and I just kind of walk right in. And Chuck kind of openly confronted me and barked at me for being late and, you know, whatever. Now, that's one of those moments where you got to choose. Am I, am I going to sort of not back down, or am I, you know, what, you know, what are you, you going to do? So even though it wasn't really any of his business, I just kind of calmly explained to him that the boss and I had arranged that there were certain days when I need to leave, go to class, and then just come right back. So I had the permission to do that, and that's exactly what I had done. And Chuck was so delighted that I had a special deal with the boss. Or try spitting mad. Like, I just remember him walking away, and he just started slamming stuff around. And he wasn't just mad at me. He was mad about me, about our boss, that he would have the nerve to give me a deal that he never offered Chuck. So I piped up. I said, well, there's still room in the Spanish 103 class that I'm in in case you want to, you know, maybe a few classes. No, I value keeping my face intact. I didn't say a word after that, but I mean, going back to Jesus' story, doesn't that remind you of the early morning workers? I'll read again at verse 11. And on receiving the denarius from the boss after their long day's work, they what? They grumbled at the master of the house saying, hey, these guys... They last, they last uh, worked only one hour, and hey, you made them equal to us. It's that word grumbling that should catch our attention. And this is usually how grumbling works. It starts on the inside, and then it starts to come up and starts leaking out of the sides of our mouth to the people who happen to be within proximity until finally we work up the courage for an actual confrontation with the boss and, and, and we say, boss, I brought a chart. Boss, you, you don't understand. Like, I, I worked he, this much, and this guy only worked this much. But then you paid this guy this much, which means that you should be paying me way more. Why are we so adamant about that? Well, because it just doesn't seem fair. We think he just missed something. People... But here's the thing, the kingdom, God, Jesus is teaching us about the kingdom, that grace is never about fairness. You know, uh, it, people commonly link this story to the, the concept of, of last-minute conversions. Like if you're picturing the most hardened, just the most foul, undeserving, slimiest person you know right now, and you, then you picture them on their deathbed. And then you imagine that in their, in their last 72 hours, maybe in their final breaths, the unthinkable happens. They lift their eyes to heaven, and, and they apologize. They take ownership for a, a wasted life and all of their sins, and they look to Jesus and say, Jesus, would you forgive me, and, and may I have a place with you in heaven? And they're just, you know, kind of like sliding into home, right? And if God's word is the umpire, he sees, he, he watches, and he goes, safe, he's in. And there are people like us in the crowd that go, boo, that's not fair. Of course, unless it's somebody that we've been praying for and have loved our entire lives, right? See, what Jesus is trying to teach us about the kingdom is that it's the king and the kingdom are all about grace. And grace is never going to be 
about our best ideas of fairness, or at least the ones that we can put together. But I'm telling you, this doesn't just apply to last minute con- conversions. This is, this is knowledge that you and I can apply all the way through life. There are going to be moments where you find yourself fantasizing about somebody else's bigger house, or, or somebody else's easier marriage, or somebody else's longer career, or better health, or their apparently happier life, and you think to yourself, hey, that's not fair. And if God is so good, then why don't I have any of those things? You might be sitting here today, having been a citizen of this kingdom, belonging to God for the last four decades. Or you could give your heart to that kingdom today. And for the rest of your days on earth, you may never be freed from a certain kind of temptation or a certain kind of urge or a certain kind of of, of malady in your life, something that you feel like just plagues you over and over, and God may never take that away. You know who can relate to you is a guy in the Bible named Paul. He was an apostle, and if you go to 2 Corinthians 12, you'll see that he was very transparent with the people that he was spiritually mentoring. He explained to them, he called it a thorn in his flesh, and scholars aren't really sure if it was a physical thing or a spiritual thing or, or, or whatever it was, but it was something that was plaguing him nonstop, constantly, And what he expresses is that he prayed about that the perfect number of times, enough. And every time, he said, the response I received back from God was this, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is always going to be enough. And so it was from that point forward that Paul accepted the grace that God had given, and he accepted the grace that he was asking for and God was not giving And he saw that as an opportunity for God's strength to show up in all of his weaknesses. And that God's grace would not only bring him this far, but it would be God's grace that would show him how to get through this life until he got to a perfect next one. See, God wants us to know that grace means that some people are going to get a better deal than the rest of us get. And he's not ashamed about that. He, he just wants us to know. It's a great illustration of how grace works. So think about it. If the, if the vineyard owner was ashamed about his absurd pay scale, don't you think he would have he paid the earliest workers first and then just kind of let them flee the scene so that nobody would see the special deal he was giving later and later workers? But it's, it's almost like that's the twist in Jesus' story is that it's like on purpose and readily seen by everybody that not only did he have the generosity to give some people more, he's got the authority to do so. And so what that means is that some people are going to get a better deal than others because of grace, and that will never mean that you are loved less, and it never means that something is wrong with you. God's generosity to others is never a statement about how he feels about you. God's generosity is always a statement about God. So in God's kingdom, everybody comes out ahead. Grace is never about fairness. And let me give you a final note that we can really grow from in this story. It's this. Beware of the cancer of envy. There's this great line in the book of Proverbs. It goes like this. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. It's Proverbs 14.30. Envy rots the bones. Suddenly, these workers who were at one point so thankful to be included, now they view themselves as having gotten what? A raw deal. And they say, hey, we bore the burden. We held the fort in the worst, like the scorching part of the day. And you got to love the boss's response. I'll read it again. He says, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity You know what? You sure loved my generosity a moment ago when it was being poured all over you. Why do you begrudge my generosity now? And I think we know why. It's because it's this thing that's alive in us and it's going to be alive in whatever kingdom we run. We just can't shake. It's too natural to us. It's called 
envy. And it kind of shows up, think of it this way, when you're at work and you're speaking among colleagues in the same office and you're content with your work and you're content with your pay until some other guy tells you a number. And suddenly you're beside yourself because you want the deal that somebody else is getting. That's called envy. Even to the point that you're willing to go on the offensive. What's the antidote? If we got to beware of the cancer of envy, what's the antidote? Well, we've talked about it throughout this morning and during worship. It's the idea of gratitude. It's about choosing to acknowledge how good God has been, how good he is being, how good he is in a way that moves us to action. Gratitude is always going to be the antidote for envy. It reminds me of a, a song that kind of had its season in worship sessions and churches. It's still alive in many of our hearts. I'm not going to sing it for you, but I'll give you the words. It, just, it goes like this. All of you is more than enough for all of, for all of me. And for every need that I could have, you, you satisfy me with your love. And, and all that I have in you, hey, you know what? That's more than enough. And if you didn't give me another thing after this day, I am richly blessed. I have enough. I have enough to be blessed. I have enough to get home to you. Gratitude is always going to be the antidote for envy. Beware of the cancer of envy. What's the application for us? Well, the application is pretty simple. I want to give you this idea that you can let grace run the table in your life because you could be saved by grace and you can live by grace every day that you live and you can celebrate grace anytime it pops up. You see, Jesus ends this story with a real simple line he's kind of famous for. He says, the last will be first and the first will be last. And we always kind of want to walk up to Jesus and when we say, oh, so that's how we crack the code. The last will be first, the first will be last. So I'm just supposed to go, thanks, Jesus. Appreciate the inside ball. And Jesus, Jesus says, oh, no, no, no. Let me see that. And Jesus goes, what I'm trying to say is that my grace is always going to break all of your rules. Grace always breaks the rules, and we tend to want to cherry pick when we feel deserving. We kind of want to cherry pick the moments when we think we can earn a little bit more to get a little bit more, work a little harder to get a little more reward. But you who are saved by grace, you can live by grace, which means every day, I want you to know your life is going to get a little better and a little better when we remember that overall you and I deserve nothing. God did not have to include us, you and I, when we're being most honest. We realize that we're fairly bent and broken. In fact, that Ephesians passage we read, it describes us in our sin. We're not just a little bit lost. Ephesians 2 says we were dead in our sin. The Bible's trying to help us know that we are eternally unable to do anything kind for ourselves. We're powerless, helpless eternally when Jesus came and found us. And then God transforms us with his kindness. It's, a, it's an amazing grace, and it's powerful enough to push strength into every weak area in our lives and give us real hope in the face of every impossibility. You can be saved by grace rather than what you think you can do. You can live by grace every day of your life. And don't miss this. You could be a celebrator of grace anywhere you see that grace pop up. And you can do that. Why? Because you know that you've received more than enough. You know that you've got plenty. You've got more grace than you could ever spend. And when you run across somebody, you see somebody in society who gets an even better deal, you can be, you can be like totally happy for them without an ounce of conflict in your heart. Glad when they succeed. Do you want to let grace run the table and get on to living in God's kingdom today? Listen, it's all about grace. So be rescued by grace. Don't fall into thinking it was something that you did. 
Start living by grace every day and celebrate grace whenever you see it. Can we pray for each other? God, you opening your kingdom to us, it's, it's the greatest invitation that we have ever received. God, we want to say thank you for your incredible generosity, not just because you deserve thanks, but because it changes our hearts every time we acknowledge it. Teach us to be grateful people because you are a generous God. Pray your gratitude would shape and define how we live. Father, I wanna, I wanna pray for people here today who would admit that every time they look in the mirror, they don't see somebody that they want more grace to be shown to. They see somebody who routinely disappoints them for how much they haven't earned and how they have failed. And Lord, I just wanna pray for any man, woman, and child who's standing in that position. Teach us how to just step into the flow of your kingdom and trust you. You are the king and you are gracious and generous and that is how your kingdom is and we can't change it. All we can do is give into it and let it change our lives from the inside out. And Father, I wanna pray for, I wanna pray along with anybody who's here today who needs to make a first time decision to step into your kingdom, to stop living life according to what they could expect or what they could earn and instead say, I want more than that. And it's the grace that you are offering them for free. If that's you, from your heart of hearts, just pray this to God right now. God, I admit that I am undeserving, that's clear to me, and you wanna give me more than I can deserve, and you've done it through Jesus Christ by sending him to pay for all of the sin that would keep me apart from you for eternity, for dying the death I should have died, and to being raised again to an eternal life I never could have lived without you. And I receive Jesus' life into my life, and I ask for your forgiveness so that I could belong to you, change my life because of Jesus and not because of me. And for all of us, Lord, we pray that we could step into a week this week where your gener generosity flows through our lives. It's an amazing grace, and that's the level of life we want to live. In your name we pray. Amen.